Deep End being described as a scientific first. Researchers from nearly 30 universities and institutions across North America have teamed up to create an arsenal of new biological tools that will play a critical role in the battle against brain disease. The scientists at the Allen Institute successfully created more than 1,000 of them. Steve is down in the ARC Lounge with Dr. Bosilka Tesic and Trigva Bakin, the Institute's Director of Molecular Genetics. Steve? Yes. And you're an assistant investigator, I think, is your title, correct? That's correct. To make sure I have that right. Both of the Allen Institute. Thank you for coming in. Thanks. Thank and you. And congratulations, <laughs> I guess I should say about this. This is a big deal. It is. We feel it's a big deal. Ex explain <laughs> why. I mean, uh, for a lot of people who maybe don't have a scientific background, myself included, I was uh, better at English, that sort of thing, as opposed to science and math. But why is this such a big deal? So I would say first, what we have learned over the last probably decades is that individual brain diseases are um, the cause of the individual brain diseases in individual cell types. Okay. Meaning not the whole brain is diseased, but individual portions of the brain and specifically certain cells. Okay. To study those diseases, you want to be able to access those cells. You want to be able to ask what they do. You want to be able to see them. And our toolkit that we have described actually provides that ability. Okay. To be able to experimentally go to those specific cell types, look at them, perturb them, activate them, inactivate them, and ask them how, what is the effect? Amazing. So it's kind of a breakthrough in a way. And and one of it the big be. yeah, and one of the big challenges in the brain is just the enormous complexity of cells. I can imagine. You, you have, there's a lot in there. Yeah, and <laughs> just in the mouse brain, there's over five thousand cells, and different still kinds of cells. Probably more. Oh my. <laughs> and yeah. there's probably even more, and you know, as we look deeper, so. Just incredible. Yeah. I'm, I want to make sure get uh, get this right. So let, let's break down these these tools. They're called enhancer AAV vectors. Is that right? That's how we, we kind of name them. Okay. Um, these adeno-associated viruses um, are naturally existing viruses, but they, are, they can be modified in such a way that they don't, don't have almost any virus in them. Okay. So they can be used as an innocuous cargo-carrying particles that can be delivered to mouse, can be delivered to human, actually. There are therapies, there are gene therapies now that exist. Wow. And you can imagine you can deliver any type of cargo, basically, something that can heal a neuron that is diseased, let's say. Okay, so talk about how like these tools are gonna to be used in this research, how does that work? So first I think in basic research, many of us, including me, I'm a biologist, I'm a basic a biologist, I wanna use them to learn how do certain cell types, how do certain neurons work? And if I perturb them, what does that do to an animal? Does an animal, let's say, I don't know, is the animal thirsty? Is mm -hmm. the animal more hungry? I'm mm -hmm. taking very simple behaviors, but it can be more complex behavior. Does an animal learn better, for example? Towards looking at the clinic, which is our colleagues, many of our colleagues are doing that, is can we fix a particular type, neuronal type usually, that is damaged or is malfunctioning in disease? Can we add to this particular neuron something that it needs to function properly? Okay. Mm -hmm. How will this change the game, do you think? Maybe you can chime in on this in terms of the research that goes into uh, looking into brain disease. I mean, I think the real power of these tools and this toolkit is that it's flexible and it's scalable and it can translate across species. So we can use the same tool in these models, um, animals, and then learn about the cell function, circuit function, and then really take those tools, refine them a bit, and as a proof of principle, and it'll take some extra work, but we can move that into humans and treat disease. I was gonna, and you kind of alluded to my next question, which is, you know, what is the hope with this? I mean, this is a, a huge thing, but it could really open the doors for a lot of many different areas when it comes to researching brain disease. Many, and it's already opening the doors. There is extremely exciting study that was published from Ellen Institute, so I'm citing our, I'm citing own, our studies study? just because I know them, just yeah. because I know them well, uh, where there is a childhood epilepsy it's called the Dravet syndrome. It's a mutation in a particular gene, but that gene does not affect all cells in the brain. It affects specific cells. When that gene is mutant, children develop this very pretty, uh, very severe form of epilepsy. Our uh, colleagues, Boaz Levy, is a, uh, a corresponding author on that study, which is kind of like the author that led the study. Yeah. He, uh, they showed that in a mouse model, you can deliver this gene back to specific cells 
and you can cure the mouse model of the disease. Wow. If you deliver it to all cells, not good. Not good. You can actually have, you can even exacerbate the disease. But specifically pinpointing in one. That so makes I a think difference. that's the important thing. Where do you deliver it and which cells get to make the cargo that's necessary to fix them? Okay. And Go yeah, ahead. and I would just say that, you know, even diseases that are incredibly complex, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, other things that have a lot of variety, in fact, millions of people, we can pair these kinds of genetic tools with maps of brain disease and to really hone in on what are the vulnerable cells early in the disease and can you deliver a therapy that can really stop the disease in its tracks. I would imagine uh, the, the amount of work that went into creating this toolkit has been quite complex. When did this begin? How long has this been going on? I would say... I'm, I'm still amazed that we even achieved this, honestly. Like, I mean, we joined roughly when? Like, I joined maybe 14 years ago, Allen yeah. Institute. First, I didn't even think we will have achieved by now the understanding or the description of the number of cell types, the number of diverse cells in the brain. But really, the groups of cells that look alike and to do a like function. And then the idea that we will... So, I think the ideas have been there. The motivation has been there, but the technologies have have improved and ripened to get to a point where we can now deliver this at scale. So I would say this is, we have been working on this and thinking about this for a while. It's just what are the pieces and what are the technologies that can be combined to arrive to this? And I think the key, one key thing was using naturally occurring switches for these individual neurons to discover them and to put them back into neurons to turn on genes we want. Amazing. For people that are living at home that maybe have uh, a brain disease, for example, what do you hope they take away from this? I, I mean, I would hope that they, there's, there's hope out there. We're building these maps of disease in the brain and that we really are building out a precision toolkit to, to help to treat these diseases. And I think this is really on the horizon. It's, it's something that'll become a reality in the coming years. Just amazing. Anything else that I didn't ask that you think is important to pass along? No, I just want to say science is exciting. It is. <clears throat> and we're really glad you are. You have invited us, and we, we love to talk about it. We love other people to learn about it. I, uh, one thing I want to <laughs> add is just, you know, we've done a lot at the Allen Institute, but it takes the whole scientific community yes. to do this. And it really takes NIH's support to support this open science um, and, you know, really drive these treatments forward. So that, that I would just say, t takes everyone working together a, on this. More than a couple dozen institutions sort of working together it with would this. And it, and it wouldn't effort. have been possible really without very serious NIH support. So we hope that continues. Yes, hope that funding <laughs> continues. Yes. yes. Thank you both and congratulations. Thank That's you very really, much. really, really cool. I mean, Thanks. isn't science amazing? It's amazing. <laughs> wow. And in such a relative short time period too. It's just, it's great work and hats off to them. Absolutely. All right.